Okay, we are live. Okay. Um, very good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody from Southeast Asia. I don't know where you are, but uh, depending on where you are, good evening or good afternoon. Uh, sorry, we are good. We are good afternoon. It's good morning or good evening. Uh, I'm Vikram Khanna. I'm the associate editor of the Straits Times, which is Singapore's main media outlet, and uh, I have the pleasure to chair the session on uh, Southeast Asia's the impact of COVID in Southeast Asia on equity issues. Uh, we have a terrific panel um, uh, on your on my right, uh, on the top right of your screen is uh, Kanesan from Malaysia. Uh, on the bottom left, uh, there's Eddie Tai from Vietnam, and on the bottom right, there's Ira Kleiner, who seems to have gone inv invisible, but I hope he becomes visible again. Uh, Ira from the Philippines. Uh, we are missing, unfortunately, we're missing Eri from Indonesia, who said he couldn't make it, and Nata Korn from Thailand has yet to arrive. Uh, but I think we are going to get started anyway. Uh, just, I'll just say a few few words in advance. Uh, three days ago, the, you know, the World Bank released its uh, October update of the East Asia Pacific Economic Outlook. Well, just, just, yeah, on just at the end of September, it's a pretty sobering report. Now, it's quite a long report. So I, I will just just highlight uh, three of the main conclusions. One is that economic growth in our region, Southeast Asia, is going to be the worst since 1967. That's the worst in 60, uh, 53 years. Um, and so that is um, the, the growth is going to come in at minus 3.5% this year for Southeast Asia, which is usually a high growing region. This does not include China, by the way. Um, so that's number one. Number two, 38 million people are going to be pushed into poverty. I mean, of those about 34 million would have been lifted out of poverty uh, had it not been for the virus, but they will remain in poverty. And 5 million new, there'll be a new uh, additional poverty of 5 million more. So basically, we're going to have a new class of a new poor class. And I think one of the most uh, devastating aspects of this pandemic is its impact on inequality. Uh, as Antonio Guterres of the UN said, we are we, we, we in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. I mean, some people are in luxury yachts and, and others are in just rickety canoes. And, and some, some, pe some people are in floating in the water, clinging onto debris. So inequality is a huge impact of this of this pandemic. Number three, although by and large uh, Southeast Asian countries have handled the pandemic relatively well compared to some other regions, uh, there are differences between countries. Uh, among the top performers, relatively speaking, are uh, Malaysia and Thailand, who have done relatively well. Uh, Vietnam has also done very well as in, and is in fact recovering and and Eddie tells us life is back to normal pretty much. Uh, at at uh, bringing up the rear are Indonesia and the Philippines, which are still struggle, struggling uh, to come to grips with the virus, according to the World Bank. Although this may be a little dated, uh, Ira will update us. Uh, the reasons for these variations are number one, uh, a difference in the levels of social protection, the difference in the robustness of the health system. A difference in the robustness of the digital infrastructure in these in these different countries, and decisive action to deal with the pandemic, which a policy response, which has also been somewhat different. Uh, so that uh, that's the basic backdrop of what the World Bank has has reported uh, just three days ago, uh, and now we can go into uh, some uh, individual perspectives from different countries. Uh, uh, maybe we can start with uh, Kanesan uh, from Malaysia. Uh, I, I request you first, everybody, to um, all speakers, to please just take one minute to explain uh, who you are, what organization you work for, and what job you do. So, Kanesan, over to you. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, hi, Kanesan Veliplay here. I'm the CEO of uh, US Art Bank International Limited. We are a new company uh, that has just taken over a huge uh, gallery uh, business in Malaysia and we are regional players. We are here we are in Indonesia, we are in Hong Kong and China. 
So we intend to we intend to grow this business into the digital world, uh, digitizing, assetization, securitization, tokenization. That's the business that we're going to be in in a, in a, in a short run. Yeah, in a short. Run. Thank you, uh, Ira. Could you tell us uh, where you're coming from? Yeah. Hi, Vikram. Um, and thank you. Uh, my name is Ira Keener. I'm the uh, founder, chairman, and CEO of uh, DLogical Corp. It's an online commodity trading uh, platform. And uh, the three main benefits that it, that, that it does is basically give price optimization. It provides transparency and it also... Um, Sorry, you seem to have gone muted. Okay. Uh, okay, try again, Ira. We, we lost you for a while. We lost you after the second benefit. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ira Keener. Um, uh, yeah, I'm the founder, chairman, and CEO of d -Log, And uh, it's been around for um, one year now. And yeah, we're in our growth phase okay. right now. Very good. Uh, Eddie, uh, over to you. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Eddie Tai. I'm a partner with 500 Startups. Uh, 500 Startups is a global early stage venture capital firm headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, I'm one of two lead partners of our Vietnam focused fund. I'm based here in Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so now uh, can we just have a broad overview? of the impact of the pandemic in your country. Uh, within that overview, if, if you could give us some idea of how different groups have been impacted in society, uh, which groups are the worst affected, uh, are there any winners from this pandemic? Who are, the, who are these winners? Uh, if you can give us some idea of the, just the, the, the broad impact of the pandemic in, on society. Kanesan? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's give Oh, no. Sorry, we've lost the video for a while. Uh, services for universal medical services here. So that's that's one area that we are we are blessed that we have that. Second thing, we have also the mechanized mechanism to distribute directly uh, any subsidy or uh, uh, cash handout so that we reach out to the very bottom of the society. Uh, thirdly, the government was very very rapid in reacting and uh, ensuring that every level of society. Uh, there was support, including the SMEs, the big corporation. I mean, like we had six months of uh, loan monitoring that just ended yesterday. Yeah, so mm -hmm. business support is there, and they have extended the salary support for the SMEs. Now they've done as much as possible. More importantly, the government was able to clamp down, shut down the country, control the epidemic, uh, pandemic, and now open back the economy. So the economy is open back. But the impact has been large amount of unemployment. And going forward, the future employment is also going to be tough. Now, looking at all this, uh, the government was able to maintain a very large consumption pattern by immediately pumping money into its civil service. Okay. Uh, so, so that kept it going. Right. Has there been a lot of layoffs in the... In, in uh, in private, yeah, the, the layoffs have been in the. There have been layoffs, but not as severely as you you may see. There's been pay cuts. There's been rationalisation, but a pre, a pre, a bigger seats are the tourism sector and aviation sector, and right. of course the migrant labour. You know, the first right. to go. There, there, there is there is not much uh, social. There's not safety net for the migrant labour, uh, but. The societies and the government has re reached out to, to also take care and handle them. So all medical tests and on, on migrant labor was at the, at the, at the, the was billed to the government. So they went in, they enveloped the place, they contained the issue. Okay. Right. Uh, Ira, how about the Philippines? I gather you've had repeated lockdowns on and off. So how has it gone how, and what has been the impact? Sure. 
Well, the uh, the health crisis could have definitely been handled better. Um, you know, I, I could go on and on about that. But um, as far as you know, as far as the current situation, um, you know, the curve appears to be flattening, and um, I certainly hope that the data to support that is you know is is, is accurate as well. Um, and no knock on you know the Philippine government um, you know whatsoever, but uh, that's something that you know we really have to have like you know strong um, you know level of confidence in before you know. Um, because now we're starting to see the economy um, open up again and we're starting to see even the retail sector, you know, we're seeing hotels, um, you know, some of the most vulnerable um, industries in the economy have basically begun to start, have, have begun to start operating again. And so um, having said that, um, I think that, you know, there are some very, very important measures that need to be implemented, um, particularly pre preventative measures, like, you know, things like, um, you know, vaccines are, 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 you know, I mean, are, are a very obvious, um, very obvious thing. But then, um, you know, PPEs and, and you know, hazmats and, and, and things of that nature and basically to restore, you know, the consumer's confidence once again in being able to re-enter these establishments, you know, the retail uh, establishments, you know, the malls, the restaurants, um, airlines, uh, travel, um, all of these things I think are essential to bringing the Philippines back back into, um, you know, uh, back into its stride again, if you will. Okay, but can you tell us who have been the losers and who have been the winners? Who, who, which has been the worst affected groups in society? And are there any winners? So um, I'll start off with with with, with the winners. Um, the winners, I think, really have. I mean, it, it's very Darwinian in, in a sense because, like, you know, the 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 you know the mantra has become like you know adapt and survive, right? And so um, the very nature of technology is basically to innovate, and in, innovation, I think, is is the way to adapt and survive. And so, um, having said that, um, technology by its very nature is, uh, you know, is innovative. And the pandemic has basically posed a lot of um, internal and external stressors that have forced the technology uh, sector and, you know, entrepreneurs to basically innovate and develop solutions to the problem. So I think technology is definitely um, number one on my list as far as like, you know, the winners. Um, logistics is also, um, for me, I, in my own humble opinion, I guess like, one of the other winners as well um, in, in from an economic sense, simply because, you know, it's the way to basically um, move goods around and, and get food uh, delivered. Um, basically, you're very, very um, essential, essential um, things. And so um, as far as the losers go, I think that, you know, a lot of the a lot of the people that a lot of the um, industries that, like travel, um, travel, uh, the hotel industries and, and all of the layoffs that have been associated um, with which um, the middle class has definitely shrunk because like now we're seeing 17.7% uh, unemployment um, wow. coupled with an inflation rate of about 3.5%, which would seem to indicate that consumer confidence is at a very, at, at an all time low. And okay. so it's not quite stagflation. It's the opposite, but you know, it's a bit of a problem. So I think, it's it's key to restore consumer confidence in order to restore demand in the economy again. Right. Well, thanks, thanks, uh, Ira. Uh, Eddie, and what's the situation in Vietnam? Uh, Vietnam has uh, handled the uh, pandemic quite well, uh, thanks to lessons from the SARS days, uh, thanks to working with the U.S. CDC and developing local capability. And so, for example, uh, cumulatively, there have only been uh, fewer than one thousand one hundred confirmed cases in Vietnam. Uh, that's uh, in a country of 95 plus million people. Uh, it makes Vietnam one of the best countries in the world uh, on, that, on that basis. Um, despite uh, you know, widespread testing, contact tracing, et cetera, uh, the, the case count has been low. And a lot of those cases have been repatriations. Uh, mm -hmm. folks who have been uh, Vietnamese from abroad being flown back. So been quite good. Um, but that said, uh, Vietnam's uh, the, the impact of uh, the, the virus on Vietnam's economy has has been adverse, just like for many other countries. Uh, Vietnam did face a three week lockdown in the second quarter of last year, uh, which which ground the economy to a halt. Um, losers uh, from that lockdown and beyond that lockdown, largely in consumer um, especially uh, where where foreign consumption was involved. So the tourism industry in particular accounted for 8% of GDP in Vietnam. That was basically wiped to zero uh, for, for several months. Um, beyond consumer, uh, similar to themes that were mentioned earlier, um, 
SMEs, particularly SMEs that had not integrated technology into their operations or their product and services, um, those really struggled. Um, so, and on the flip side, winners, yeah, uh, the, the more forward-looking businesses uh, in, in tech uh, or whether they're using tech uh, in, in terms of uh, whether it's actually product or service delivery or working remotely or uh, and so on. Um, so that's both among companies that are local as well as those that are um, – uh, serving foreign clients uh, around developing solutions around remote work, around um, uh, you know back office support, things like that. So, um, all in all, generally quite good here in Vietnam. Uh, projected two to three percent growth in GDP this year, which is still off of the historical growth of six or seven percent. That that shows the negative impact of COVID, but compared to other countries, definitely um, a lot better here than that it could be. Right. Very good. That sounds that sounds pretty encouraging. Maybe you're the. I mean, you're you're you're, you're probably the, the the furthest off the off the blocks. Uh, I think so. <laughs> Knock on wood, it stays that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very good. Um, we seem to have temporarily lost. Hopefully, temporarily lost Kanesa. Uh, and I I don't know if he can hear us. Um, but let let me let me move on anyway. Um. I want to talk. Uh, I want you to address the issue of how working habits and consumer habits have changed, and what do you think of whether these how long lived these changes will be. We in Singapore are. Um, I mean, a lot of us are still working from home, even though the government has lifted a lot of the restrictions. I think a lot of companies have adapted. They have started uh, selling online when they never used to. Um, they have. Uh, they have started hiring a remote workforce, which they never used to. Uh, consumer behavior has also changed. A lot of people are moving online, which they never did before. Uh, so I, I want to get a sense of how business and consumer behavior has changed and adapted in response to the pandemic. So uh, maybe Ira, maybe you could start with uh, start with Cody. Sure, and thank you for the question. Yeah, and I think the, uh, a lot of the adaptive strategies that businesses have employed you know, um, throughout this pandemic uh, really goes back again to, you know, the technological innovations that, you know, have evolved as well, you know, as a result of the external stressors, again, um, caused by the, you know, the pandemic, such as the lockdowns and so forth. And so that's forced us into a situation where work from home or WFH, w, um, um, if you're a millennial, um, uh, w- <laughs> would say, but yeah, um, WFH has definitely become like, you know, the dish of the day, if you will. Um, And so now it's basically promoted a lot of, you know, a lot of ways to work remotely. And so a lot of tools are starting to to come about where, you know, people can work um, and can meet such as, such as now, um, you know, where geography is now no longer an issue. And so we've sort of moved from the digital, um, from the physical realm to the digital realm um, as an adaptive strategy. As far as um, consumer behavior goes, I think that the, you know, the, utility functions and the, um, you know, consumer preferences have basically also changed in terms of the way that they, uh, you know, in terms of the way that they entertain our, uh, ourselves because, and again, because of, because of the lockdowns, um, uh, these lockdowns have basically forced um, individuals to have, you know, have, um, lost, you know, a lot of their, their, their civil liberties granted under the constitution of the Philippines. And um, because of that, um, you know, Again, you know, there evolved ways of, of doing things. So now people are now starting to focus on spending their their resources at home and improving the quality of life that they have at home, as opposed to like going out to the restaurant or to the resort that they used to go to for their staycations or you know or or, or traveling. So definitely, a lot of those a lot of those things that people used to do, a, a lot of the civil civil liber, liberties that were available to us at, at one point, are now being replaced by other methods of, of, of keeping oneself entertained. And so, I, again, um, just to recap, basically, you know, spending more money at home, um, improved quality of, um, you know, the, 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 the food, the cooking, um, you know, the um, people watching more, more, more television at home. Um, and so, yeah, as far as consumer behavior goes, that's, that's just, that, that's my take. Okay. Eddie, uh, how about you in, 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 uh Vietnam, how have uh, businesses and consumers adapted or changed? And how long do you think these changes will last? 
Yeah, um, well, first I'll echo what Ira just mentioned about working from home. Uh, even though the economy here is back to normal and, and people can return to offices, a number of offices took the opportunity to, to uh, evolve to working from home. And so uh, we've seen some companies uh, reduce or eliminate office space altogether, um, shift to more to, to more um, distributed teams like that. Uh, so that's one impact that I think uh, we'll probably see in many countries around the world. Uh, in terms of specific to Vietnam, I, I would add on two uh, additional things. Uh, one, uh, more on the kind of the enterprise business development side, a lot of um, uh, effort from uh, different kinds of Vietnamese businesses in different industries to target um, business from overseas. Um, this is really with with China being the first hit and uh, the disruption of supply chain there. Uh, a lot of um, major companies around the world started to look. Uh, for alternative locations, and Vietnam is definitely trying to be at the forefront of that. Okay. On the consumer side, it's kind of the reverse because uh, travel restrictions are still up, um, uh, so so it's hard for foreigners to get in. Uh, but life within the country is back to normal. A lot of the um, effort uh, among businesses has been to to really drive up local domestic consumer spend, some of through e-commerce, uh, but also uh, just. Uh, traditional spending as well uh, it's it is what the tourism is hoping uh, tourism industry here is hoping to survive on uh, getting getting locals to do uh, what's been called revenge travel revenge tourism we're no longer locked down we, can, we have the ability to fly within the country to go to and, and, and kind of live a normal life so um, uh, yeah uh, so so some some boost in e-commerce but also just a general inward focus on, on the con some consumer marketing side to uh, unlocking that domestic consumer dollar Terrific. Uh, and Kanesan, and how about Malaysia? How have businesses and consumers adapted? How have, they, how have their lives changed? And how permanent do you think these changes will be? Well, I think for the SME sector, the food, uh, the food and logistics sector, there's been a uh, there's been a overnight shift into digital. What they we used to say, we need to be digital a year ago. When two weeks later, they are fully digital. One, two. Logistics, as, as, as um, uh, Ira was telling, logistics has had a major boom for domestic as well as international inbound uh, delivery systems. But me, I think uh, there is the, because we, we shut down quite, uh, quite stringently, when the lockdown was lifted, there has been a pent up demand. So, you know, like Mercedes is all time high sales. You know, can you imagine? Car sales, wow. uh, you don't have supply of enough supply because the logistics side as well, you don't have enough supply of Volvos to deliver. Uh, the new Proton launch is sold out. So suddenly you're seeing on the, the, the two streams at the consumer mid and high consumer level, people are spending. You know, we had two property launches. They're 100% sold. 100% sold. And this wow. is five months ago, people said forget about property launches. Uh, they've gone in and they've gone into there and brought value. So value has come where you can meet the consumer's expectations. So people are confident that this will pass and they feel that this window of opportunity is going to be there. Uh, and also, of course, the pent-up demand. Some of the hotel resorts are fully booked through to the end of year. Uh, mind you, 30-40% supply has come down as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of winners, rubber gloves, medical companies, Great winners. Uh, I, I think um, there has been a large number of uh, companies, uh, SMEs who are in the food sector that had to close down simply because there were mom and pop operations which couldn't get into the digital economy. They couldn't get into the, the, the what we call Grab, uh, the Uber service of delivery of food, etc. Now they are left behind. So now the government is uh, going into a project to bring them back into the scale and get them into the digital economy. So one thing that has happened is this country has gone tremendously digital from a year ago. So right. that's a great thing. And we also have poorer, uh, poorer internet because uh, the, 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 the pipe is the same, but the yeah. usage has just gone up. So uh, I, I think it's the same for every country. So yeah. even you can be in the capital city, you're going to have lines dropping as happened to me just now. So that's it, there we are. Yeah. I just well, want to comment on that. Um, yeah. It's almost as though the pandemic has um, 
become impetus to you know the acceleration of industrial revolution 4.0 yeah absolutely i i did i didn't interview uh, a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago with uh, forest lee the ceo of this company called c s e a and they run this uh, online e-commerce platform called shopee shopee yeah. uh, shopee um, i mean is very very popular all across southeast asia and he 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 said that by his estimation i think about 3 or 4 years of digitization has been compressed in 3 months into 3 months and literally you've had um you've had uh, companies small guys small time retailers in indonesia in remote parts of indonesia vietnam who uh, who were suddenly able to reach a market of several hundred million where they used to only cater to the, the neighborhood around them and they were able to very quite simply and some of them had have now had to move out of their shops into warehouses and you know it's it's and, and they're selling pretty much across southeast asia so he said this this has just happened in in just these three months just these three months i mean this was it's quite an incredible thing by the way the stock price of c has gone from i don't know from like 10 dollars or something in ipo last year to 150 dollars uh, on the new york stock exchange i wish i, I yeah. wish i that no, lies I, the danger Vikram, there lies the danger. Mm-hmm. Uh, there lies the danger because we are going to see a, a large amount. The people that we don't see eh, are going to yeah. be left aside. You know that they 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 can't get onto the digital platform, uh, and that's something people, the governments, the societies must reach out for. You know that's that's uh, that's a big danger. A marginalizing so, a community uh, just because of either infrastructure, education, yeah. or access. Right, right, right. And that's that's an important point. I mean, I think the whole digital divide issue has become much sharper, much more important now. Yeah, that's 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 a good point to make. So, okay, um, can we just look a little bit at the government response uh, to the pandemic and whether it has addressed the key issue of equity? How has it addressed the whole issue of inequality? Um, the, sub- the digital issue, the digital divide issue, is one aspect of this. but other things so social safety nets have the social safety nets expanded in your countries and uh is there do you think there is going to be demands for a new social contract speaking for singapore i can say the safety nets are massively expanded and uh, there may be there may well be demands for a new social contract in the form of a permanently uh, better health uh, health subsidies higher health subsidies health protection maybe even job protection so i just want you to comment on the government response and especially on social safety nets and protecting the vulnerable groups so maybe ira maybe you would might want to start from philippines so sure thing um yeah so as far as social safety nets go um, there have there have been um fiscal stimulus packages which which have been um uh, you know uh which have been initiated and uh this distributed you know amongst the populace and and you know the most marginalized in in society uh now while that may be the case uh i think that you know even though there were these um fiscal stimulus packages that were that were released uh you know for you know the, the most needy i think that it could have been much much more effective if you know if things like you know corruption um didn't didn't really play a very big part you know here in the philippine economy and so you mean just to kind of quantify and just t- touch on that and not to go off on a tangent but then just to touch on that just just for a brief um brief moment i mean there've been 410 billion us dollars that, that have been lost in um be- between the period of 1960 to 1991 so in i mean sorry um to 2001 So that's a staggering um 8.2 billion dollars a year that's being that's being stolen. So um you know when 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 you have corruption that's that, that that's that's going on a lot of these um social services and a lot of these other things that could have been going back to the people um isn't going isn't getting back to them commensurately. And so that's where I have a problem. But then yeah um as far as how the government's response um fiscal stimulus packages um have been the the dish of the day. Right. 
Yeah, um, and and Eddie, and how, how about how about in Vietnam? I mean, uh, I I know that all the countries have had stimulus packages, but I'm more interested in knowing uh, is is there a sort of a a sort of a shift in thinking about social protection, about you know, is this uh, is this going to be like traditionally? I mean, the World Bank points out that Southeast Asia spends very little on the social sector. Health and education get just barely one percent of GDP spending, compared to the well, three four times that in Europe and even even Africa spends more. So is there is there a change in thinking about this? I mean, apart from addressing the issue of how social safety nets have expanded during the pandemic. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I would say let, let's call it socially, societally, there is there is a, a bit of a shift. So. The government itself, uh, yes, uh, put in a few billion dollars, so a couple percentage points of GDP to uh, tend to the temporary stimulus among uh, the, the lowest uh, portion of the population. Also provided uh, a lending facility to SMEs uh, through through uh, interest rate uh, adjustments. Um, but those are temporary, and the, the Vietnam government, perhaps more than most of the other countries in Southeast Asia, is pretty financially resource constrained. At the same time, the healthcare infrastructure here is, is fairly modest. If you look at numbers like number of patients per bed, the average nationwide is still about two, two patients for every bed in the entire country, uh, which is partially why Vietnam has been so aggressive about trying to control the pandemic in the first place, uh, because there's no capacity to, to handle if the pandemic actually spreads within the country. So. Um, so that, that points to, one, the, the actual social safety net provided by the government, I don't think it's going to be able to change much because of limited resources and so on. But what they're doing is trying to create a safe space that the people will try to stay safe as long as possible. But recognizing what, what this has done is kind of highlighted uh, that, that the government can only do so much if things get really bad. And so other players in, in the economy have to step up and be ready with uh, creating more capacity. And that's most explicit in healthcare. So recognizing this two patients for bed challenge, recognizing the challenge in acute uh, care of, of uh, in, uh, in intensively ill patients, the private sector has started to step up in terms of creating that capacity. So that's, that's encouraging to me. And the government has been supportive of that. Right, right. And Karnesan, you you mentioned that the the Malaysian government has done a pretty decent job in delivering benefits uh, to to many sections of society. But my, my question is, is there a change in thinking that you know you need a permanently stronger social safety net for the future? That this is not That's just always a been a question. Yeah. That's always been a question in this country. Uh, we are not a large population, about thirty odd million, uh, but we have universal health care. That means uh, for twenty five US cents, uh, one ringgit. You register a Malaysian registered registers in the in the hospital. He gets he or she gets medical care. You know, I think we are one of the few countries in the world that do that. You know, so that's mm. that's the backdrop of where we're coming from. So we were able to enforce this nationwide uh, network of government hospitals, and the private hospitals stepped up. So actually, medical care is not an issue. I, I think we can reach out. Uh, even into the into the hinterland where is that? I, I think we do far better than many countries. Now coming back to social net, there is no such thing as uh, redundancy payments, etc. There's no. But they about four years ago, the government instituted a insurance fund that's been fully funded. That came into play this year. So what happened four years ago was this this fund to 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 have. Uh, unemployment insurance, right? So we already started moving in that direction. So right. really what the government has done was to help the SMEs, which is the largest employer, uh, to sustain salary and wages for six months, and they have now extended it to end of the year. So mm -hmm. then uh, if you earn less than a thousand US dollars, up to a thousand US dollars per month, government will pay your employment. Now, there are certain conditions, which I think is fairly good, you yeah. know. But if you're a large organization, you so uh, what happens is that the, the bottom level people, are, the, the, the mid 40, the middle income people are protected. The higher income people had to take pay cuts, and a lot were laid off. But I, I well, who are, we we can't judge whether they are able to better manage it, but. The thinking is, if you are better paid, you will have better savings and you are able to take care of yourself. 
Now, we also have had what you call the Employees Provident Fund as a build-up of savings. That was allowed to be accessed. Now, all these are temporary. We need to have a larger discussion into looking at social security in the longer run as money keeps running out uh, in any economy. Right, right. Very good. Thank you. That's a t t terrific uh, answer. And uh, Malaysia seems to be doing pretty pretty well on that, on the social safety net side. Um, so, okay, I want to pivot a little bit to the whole startup sector since all of you are in some way involved in the startup world. Um, can you give me a sense of uh, how is the startup sector responding to the pandemic? Are there any innovations, pandemic specific, pandemic triggered or pandemic related, or are there any new new kinds of businesses that are coming up as a result of COVID? So, Ira, what's the situation there in the Philippines on that? Here in the Philippines, um, yeah, I think like logistics uh, again has, has really become like you know a very very popular form of. Um, uh, again, a adaptation, and because because um, you know the, the nature of the lockdowns here, you know uh, the the way they've been, they they basically have checkpoints that are you know a attached to them, and so no one can um, for a very long time nobody could leave their homes. Everyone was basically forced to you know order in, and so companies like Grab, Lala Move, uh, you know, uh, and, and and various others, you know, have begun to basically really emerge in, in in my own opinion and so uh and and we're starting to see them evolve as well like you know in a much faster way you know i mean they're starting to develop like you know um fintech solutions um you know ways to basically uh do peer-to-peer do -peer payments um you know I, I think trade finance is another is another very exciting um aspect of you know the startup community as well at, at, at this particular point um as opposed to like you know walking to your traditional brick and mortar bank and and, and doing all of your financial services within there um so uh, a lot of these a lot of these companies that you know have emerged as a result of you know the need for logistics have also then began to evolve um into other you know into other fields utilizing things like blockchain to enable like you know peer-to-peer -peer payments um, for, 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 for trade finance as well. Um, and naturally, like, you know, I mean, with, you know, because of the, the very nature of the lockdown, uh, and, and having moved to the digital realm and, and using, you know, online platforms, um, much more have basically made our data sets much more rich. And so because of, because of the much richer data sets that we now have, AI algos can basically be developed, um, in such a way that can be that can have much more predictive value than in the past. Okay, and so those are just some of the those are just some of the most um, salient points that I think, as far as adaptation with respect to technology goes. Okay, terrific. Eddie, how's, how's the situation in Vietnam? How are startups doing? Since you're you're a startup uh, investor, right? That's right. So, are you finding exciting new opportunities? Yes, uh, and challenges as well, and uh, worth, worth sharing about that. I mean, um, uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, of course, uh, lots of entrepreneurs in the country, anytime they identify a pain point, they're, they're going to try to build around that and try to make money, and, and COVID is certainly no exception. A lot of that effort has been around um, healthcare tech, uh, remote work solutions, um, solutions around making physical environments safer, uh, so so temp uh, automated temperature checking and things like that, um, and uh, remote education, I, I guess, would be another area that, that we've seen a lot of movement towards. Um, but the, the, the new ideas, uh, uh, of course, it's only been, a, well, uh, I guess, a little over a half a year now, so they're still gestating with their products and their early traction. Uh, I think there's something to be said about the existing startups that have been around for a few years as well. Uh, some of them have been rocked hard, just like uh, traditional businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. They may have seen revenue streams cut off or things like that. Um, financing for later stage investment across the region, not just in Vietnam, has been more challenged recently. Uh, as a lot of these later stage finances rely on in-person due diligence and, and in-person relationship building. That obviously can't happen quite as much now, uh, right. Zoom Zoom meetings notwithstanding. So uh, we do see a portion of these like uh, existing startups really struggling to um, get continue on their capital trajectory, continue on their operational growth. And so they either start to wind down or they start to uh, adjust to 
the new the new normal. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's uh, to be honest, it's a uh, too early to see how it's all going to shake out. But I do have an inkling that uh, most of the countries in Southeast Asia will uh, see some of their best startups launch during this time or pivot during this time. So um, that's that's exciting to be investing in. That's the silver lining. That's great. Karisan, how about Malaysia? Anything exciting happening in the startup scene? Are they doing anything anything innovative? Anything in response to this? Um, I, I think it's just it's the same. Um, um, you know, in the medical sector, delivery sector, services sector, and. Uh, and, and, and logistics sector, yeah. I think there are a lot of startups coming up. But also, I think the existing startups, have, uh, 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 some of them are shutting down. You just, you just can't continue. So they need yeah. to change, evolve it. So that's, that's 30, 40% of them will, will go through that. But I'm seeing a danger here. Uh, we just had, uh, we just came up from a lockdown and we opened up the market. And, and I see a, a, a reversal in trend. I see people shopping less on digital. I see people going to markets. I see people going up to speed. Uh, and, uh, you know, buying online is suddenly taken, you know, I'm, I'm talking of my na- my neighborhood, you know. People used to deliver vegetables, buying online. Yeah. Now they've gone back to the old habits, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, you, you wear your mask, but things like... Ooh. Sorry, we lost your audio. Can I sound? I'm sorry. <clears throat> Hello? Uh, okay, well, we we seem to have lost Can I sound temporarily. Um, so I got a flash saying three minutes, something, two minutes, three minutes left. So just in one minute, uh, gentlemen, you know, there's this phrase, build back better. So Mm -hmm. if you wanted your government to build back better, can you give three suggestions? How can the Philippines build back better after this? Okay, so I I alluded to like, um, you know, a a very big problem that we have, a systemic problem that we have here in the Philippines, which is which is corruption. Okay. And I think that digital platforms will definitely um, aid in, in, in helping to eliminate or reduce that at least. Um, it may not completely eradicate it. I think the second thing would be um, preventive measures, um, you know, for, for, for the, um, you know, basically to sustain the economy and, and to keep it going. Um, so things like, um, you know, vaccine, okay. uh, you know, and, and other ways to, you know, restore confidence again and, and, and build up um, demand. And then on the supply side, I think that the government needs to do, the government and the central bank need to have um, an, a very expansionary stance um, towards the economy in order to stimulate supply once Thanks. again. Thank you. Eddie, what can Vietnam do to build back better? Three ideas. Uh, upskill and reskill the uh, traditional labor force, uh, mm-hmm. especially low, low level manufacturing uh, and uh, agriculture. Uh, number one, number two, uh, streamline capital flows um, and uh, business uh, registration processes make it easier to form and, and capitalize companies. Um, and then uh, I, I would say number three, step back and watch the Vietnamese people do their thing. Uh, very entrepreneurial group here. I think they can work hard and do great things. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Karesan, I'm sorry we lost you halfway through your previous uh, statement. But I'm afraid we moved on. So three things Malaysia should do to build back better. Um, I, I think the improve the distribution channel for social security, uh, rethink on the on the employment uh, insurance, and number three, of course, um, more liberalisation of the economy so that capital can flow into where it's most needed. Very good. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm afraid we thank have. You out of time. Uh, I would have loved to go on. I had so many questions that I still had to ask, but uh, hopefully another time. Uh, thank you all and uh, thank you for joining this and your your insights and uh, thank you whoever in the audience is there and who listened in. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Guys, stay on, yeah? Stay on for a while. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Thank <laughs> you.
Have you? Okay. Uh, we, we just want to take a selfie. Can somebody take a selfie or we feel virtual? I'm, I'm trying to get everybody on the picture. Are you guys on it? Uh, yeah, I've already done mine. There's, uh, okay, wait, hang on. Okay, there we go. Vikram, can you take as well? Yeah, I'm going to take. Uh, everybody look into the camera. Let's see whether it works. I don't think mine is very good, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> One to go. All right. Okay. Well, very good. Oh, we're missing Ira. Great. Uh, can you see me? I can see you. We haven't seen. We haven't got Great. the selfie. Uh, Great. Anyway, it's good to know uh, that the bandwidth the, here uh, in the Philippines uh, is still working well. <laughs> I think a bunch of us, the uh, platform's having issues, but all right, really, really fun chat. Uh, thanks for, uh, for moderating and-, and oh, Thank you all, thanks, yeah. thanks for your insights, thanks a lot. Absolutely, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Awesome, bye. thanks, bye.